go ahead and um, introduce our, our speaker today. Um, we are truly delighted to have, as part of our Human Rights and Practice series, Professor Katie Young uh, joining us to talk about her groundbreaking work on human rights originalism. Um, and so she'll be discussing various components um, of that project. Um, and just to, by way of background, um, Professor Young serves as the Associate Dean for Faculty and Global Programs, Professor and Dean, Distinguished Scholar at Boston College um, Law School. Her research focuses on really a number of different cutting edge areas in human rights protections and, and law and doctrine, including, for example, economic, social, and cultural rights, law and gender, um, and increasingly questions around originalism um, in this space as well. Uh, this event is co-sponsored um, and organized by the Center for International Comparative Law and the International Human Rights Clinic um, at Duke Law. Um, we'll proceed as we normally do with these events, which is to have our um, speaker present for around 20 minutes, half an hour, and I'll open the floor for an interactive Q&A. I really encourage you um, to ask questions um, in this space, because we really are talking about uh, some contemporary trends and thinking through how human rights law gets interpreted um, and applied in often exclusionary ways. Um, so without further introduction, uh, Katie Young, we are delighted to have you at your floor. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Jane, Professor Huckabee, and thank you to the Centre for International and Comparative Law and to the International Human Rights Clinic for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here at Duke. It's also wonderful already to engage, to have engaged in some discussions with clinic students last night. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm here to talk about a diagnosis I've made of a new trend in uh, the US approach to human rights, a trend I'm calling human rights originalism. So can everybody hear me up the back okay? Okay, great. Um, so I want to just um, talk today about the novelty of this trend. I'm going to give you a, a description of what I mean by human rights originalism and some criteria by which you can see it playing out in practice uh, with some examples. And then I want to broaden the scope beyond the United States and talk about other trends where we see new actors and new strategies in the human rights and comparative rights spaces, um, strategies which seem to be an appropriative move, new arguments made in the discourse of human rights that are novel, that may not map onto originalism within the United States, but do signal some worrying trends about a, a, a kind of anti-progressive interpretation of human rights. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, moving from the United States to the world. Um, I came to this project, as you can hear, I'm Australian, like Professor Huckabee. You have another Australian American in your midst. Uh, and I've been here two decades, but before coming here, I uh, had worked in, the, uh, in Australian constitutional law and was very attuned to originalist arguments in practice within the Australian constitutional setting, Australia's constitution being almost as old as the US Constitution, uh, Australia's Constitution borrowing a great deal from the US written Constitution, and the idea of originalism as an appropriate interpretive practice holding sway within the Australian constitutional legal setting, um, less so in Australian constitutional politics. We can talk about that in Q&A, but that's how I come to this project. Uh, settler, colonial country, many parallels between Australia and the United States and the freshness of a new constitution some uh, over 200 years ago, um, and the need for a of judicial interpreters of that constitution. In, in Australia's case, uh, a seven-member high court. In the US, of course, a nine-member Supreme Court with strong judicial review. So originalism has its par parallels within uh, Australia and the United States. Uh, and so I was alert to that. But in the interim, I'd done a lot of comparative work in other countries, such as South Africa, Colombia, uh, Germany, and I was privy to many other interpretive practices in constitutional settings and in human rights settings. So my big interest in human rights is the interface between international law and national law. This is often known as the incorporation interface when domestic settings are able to incorporate human rights. There are various ways of understanding that interrelationship, and one way that fascinates me is through constitutional uh, tropes. When con nations' constitutions borrow from human rights uh, language and human rights practices and domesticate uh, constitutionally. So that's a project 
that I've been fascinated in, in a long, for a long time. Um, and that's what brings me then to diagnose human rights originalism. So I'm going to start with an example that will be familiar to you um, of originalism within the United States. This comes from 2019, July 2019, when Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, Trump's second sec Secretary of State after Rex Tillerson, decided that a major signature move he would make would be to change America's approach to human rights uh, and have a commission set up to provide some constraining principles about what human rights should mean for the United States and for its foreign policy. The United States is famously guided by human rights within its foreign policy. This is to its credit. It's legislati legislatively required to. Um, and so the big move was to uh, give some criteria for understanding what human rights should look like in that practice. So Mike Pompeo set up a commission on unalienable rights. He used the language of unalienable rights. Uh, in announcing the commission, he said human rights have lost their way. They've been proliferating. They've become quite ad hoc. We need to go back to the nation's founding principles of natural rights and natural law. And he used this language in July 2019 to constitute this commission. Now, in this picture, the, the top picture, you see the chairperson of the commission, Marianne Glendon. Uh, Marianne Glendon was a, and is a famous uh, international and comparative scholar. She was also the US representative to the Holy See. Uh, she has written a landmark book about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 in that book highlighting the role of Eleanor Roosevelt and the United States in formulating that document, a really significant book. Um, but people were worried when she was the chairperson, not because of this book, which is a really great history, um, but because of her concerted opposition and very public opposition to abortion and to marriage equality. And so Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, for instance, really worried that Marianne Glendon was to be the chairperson of a new commission that was uh, being... Uh, given the mandate to write the human rights for America's foreign policy. He wasn't the only one worried. There were hundreds of human rights groups who issued a vehement objection to the composition of this commission. Um, these are the commissioners here in this, in this photograph. Um, many of these commissioners have a great deal of expertise in religious freedom, but less expertise in uh, other human rights. And of course, there are so many important human rights uh, made up in the International Bill of Rights and the UDHR features heavily, but of course the treaties, the ICCPR, the ICESCR, uh, and their core human rights treaties, um, the US being of course uh, members of the uh, Convention uh, Against Torture, as well as the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. M many, many rights there, and of course there's the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, um, so there are very many uh, human rights treaties that go beyond the, the special expertise in religious freedom. Hence, um, a lot of objection by human rights NGOs, by faith leaders, by officials, and by individuals. So there was a lot of opposition at the time. There was litigation filed for an imbalance in, um, in the, the commission. The Duke Human Rights Clinic did a lot of work on this commission. I want to shout out just uh, what an incredible amount um, was gained from the... the, the incredible work of the clinic, clinic at that time. Um, and so what was interesting about the commission and what really caught my attention was the mandate uh, given by Pompeo to the commission to uh, draw out the human rights principles from two sources, the Declaration of Independence of 1776 and the Universal Declaration of 1948. Um, wonderful landmark documents, but clearly not the whole story on contemporary human rights law. And this move of constraining sources is recognizable for anyone who spent five minutes in constitutional law, which as law students you all have, uh, originalism being the prevailing methodology for interpreting the US Constitution, and originalism being the idea that one has to fix the meaning of the document to its understanding at the time it was drafted. Uh, so originalism is a now a huge broad tent of theories from original public meaning, uh, to original public understanding. Uh, there is a progressive living originalist perspective and a, an original intent, uh, very tightly disciplined perspective 
You do see the whole gamut in our current <coughs> Supreme Court here in the United States. Uh, but there are um, clear moves that originalism has been the su successful interpretive methodology, uh, probably at its most uh, successful pinnacle in US constitutional law now, where you would have read of all the decisions that have been guided by an originalist methodology. Um, the US uh, is famous not only for originalism as an interpretive methodology by a court, but also as a political practice. And so originalism is also a method that has been um, appearing, for example, in every Republican Party platform for the last few decades, bar one. Um, and uh, writers like Reva Siegel have noted that as well as an interpretive methodology, originalism has become a political practice that's very mobilizing and galvanizing. This is in the US constitutional space. And what I noted from this commission's work is that it seemed to be jumping into the human rights space. And jumping in a very interesting way, because no longer was it the US Constitution, which was the heroic document that needed to constrain contemporary meaning, but it was these two other fascinating instruments, the Declaration of Independence and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Clearly landmark, clearly spearheading major changes at the time. So I thought it was very interesting to bring originalism into this territory. Um, bookending 1776 to 1948 obviously takes originalism into the New Deal, into the post-war period, um, and that itself is quite a fascinating move for originalists um, because of what, what, it, what was um, circulating as the ideas of that time. So they delivered their report in uh, July 2020. Um, we can talk in the Q&A about a lot of the process objections to the delivery of that report. It really didn't change from the draft report that had been issued a few weeks before, um, but uh, this is the prescription I gave it. So I want to just talk briefly about the appeal of human rights originalism. And uh, for those who have studied American practicing human rights, there are various tropes that appear quite familiar. Um, one of the tropes that is perhaps learned in, in week one of human rights law is the American exceptionalist argument that somehow um, the American experience with human rights has been an exceptional one. And therefore, the fact that the US has not ratified the core human rights treaties, apart from CAP and, the, and CERD and the ICCPR, um, is excused because the US has always been involved in the human rights project. Indeed, the US has made a signature effort to multilaterally increase human rights uh, observance and compliance around the world. American exceptionalism is then given as an argument that somehow America has a unique relationship with human rights. For Americans, human rights is for out there, um, for uh, America to kind of police human rights violations that are occurring abroad, and that it is less a currency for calling out behaviors at home. So that's American exceptionalism. It has a few strands to it, um, but the exemptionalism strand is the one that exempts the US then from human rights obligations. And it exempts the US on either realist grounds, the US is the superpower, it gets to call the shots, or on kind of moral grounds. The US is somehow landmark and uh, uh, its, its ideals have been so integral to the human rights project that it gets ex exempt on moral grounds. And I suggest that originalism follows that latter explanation for exemptionalism. Um, other factors of human rights originalism that aren't so novel is the discourse that rights are getting out of hand, that there are too many new rights, that they're making their appearance in all sorts of ways, um, and we can think of the evolution of human rights arguments and the greater inclusion of human rights arguments that we're seeing today. The complaint is that suddenly this is proliferating, that all rights are losing currency because of this number. And originalism offers the constraining force then on greater rights proliferation. Um, another aspect of human rights originalism is the idea that there is a hierarchy of human rights. It's obviously UN doctrine that all human rights are indivisible and you can't enjoy one where others are being violated. Um, this presentation is that there is a hierarchy with religion and arguably, arguably property on top. Talk about that in a moment, um, but this comes through in the report of the Commission on Unalienable Rights. Um, so I suggest these are kind of familiar, and we see these tropes in the Commission on Unalienable Rights. But what's novel is that it's given this originalist um, over, overlay. 
which is exceptionalism, proliferation, or the control of proliferation, and the hierarchy is justified by the restriction of interpretation to those two landmark sources. Okay, so that's um, uh, the appeal of originalism. I've mentioned as a political practice, it can be very galvanizing, and I think there's a lot about the Commission on Unalienable Rights that was galvanizing to a constituency as well. So I ask, you know, where do we see originalism in human rights law? If this appears novel in the United States, can we find originalism elsewhere in human rights so that, you know, this is something perhaps new on, on American soil, but something that we can see in various aspects of human rights practice. Um, in my paper, I go into greater depth, but just as a sketch of an overview, I say that there are four main sources of human rights today and boil them down, uh, and we shouldn't be um, necessarily picking and choosing a, as one to be more valid than the other, I suggest. Um, nevertheless, none of them do we find an originalist justification to interpretation or to political practice. So in international human rights law, there's obviously um, a sea of uh, practices of interpretation in international law that applies to human rights. Um, in, many, in many people's view in a particularly special way. Um, but the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties prescribes an approach to interpretation which looks to a good faith interpretation of, of plain meaning and purpose. Uh, as a subsidiary, a subsidiary matter, you can look to the preparatory work and the context at the time a treaty was drafted. So it's a kind of original looking back that's justified as a supplementary source. But this is for a treaty. There's no selection of some kind of constitutional document that gets to um, supersede any treaties um, that might come after it. And human rights originalism is, of course, selecting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Declaration of Independence as two constitutional documents that are somehow governing us um, from the past and cutting off any subsequent document. And that is not to be found in international human rights law. Indeed, it's inimical to international human rights law particularly when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights intended for a successor treaty to be drafted um, and for, for countries to ratify that treaty. So international human rights law and originalism don't go together. Then I look to comparative human rights law, and as I mentioned, I'm very fascinated by constitutional trends of implementing human rights in various national constitutions. Um, many other constitutions do engage in a variety of, in of interpretive approaches to their constitutions. And many of those constitutions borrow from the language of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Indeed, it's really uh, interesting to map the influence of the Universal Declaration, not as a source of treaty law, but as, as a source of constitutional drafting. When judges are looking to their constitutions to look to the rights and in, interpret them, they don't use originalism to justify that. Uh, originalism is a kind of uh, subsidiary model of interpretation in, a, in some constitutional settings. In Australia, I've mentioned, um, it is one, uh, one approach to interpretation. Um, I, borrowing it actually from a Vienna Convention model, there's scope for when text is ambiguous to allow in a different variety of, of, of supplementary approaches to interpretation. Um, but you don't see originalism as a popular model of interpreting constitutions around the world. The US has become quite an outlier in this practice. So comparative human rights law and originalism don't go together. I then look to human rights vernacularization, because of course human rights aren't bound up only in treaty settings or in public law settings. There are significant movements of inclusion when social movements form a discourse around human rights and claim their entry into the discourse. And this is why we see proliferating, expanding conceptions of rights as groups who were formerly excluded are included in. You don't see originalism as a trope that these groups are using, and particularly the originalism that connects to text. So I say originalism doesn't belong there either, although we can talk about constituencies and social movements that are part of this as a political practice in the Q&A. Um, finally, philosophical approaches to human rights rely on public reason to think through what human rights and individuals should be guaranteed in order to guarantee their dignity or their freedom or their equality. In those approaches, originalism is inimical because it is not open to reasoned elaboration. It tries to fix and constrain interpretation 
in a setting that isn't open to the same type of reflection of philosophical argument. So I say human rights in, in none of these spaces connects with originalism. So it is novel. Um, it is a kind of creature that we're seeing and that we may see again with future administrations. I thought I'd give you this presentation of the UDHR because I think at that moment in 1948, it's hard to conceive what the UDHR was promising and how it connects uh, to us now in 2023 today. And I think um, for me, the UDHR is really well um, depicted by a series that Norman Rockwell was commissioned to, to um, paint uh, as part of the war effort. He was uh, asked to display the four freedoms that obviously made their way into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Franklin D. Roosevelt's platform of four freedoms um, found uh, uh, language in the Atlantic Charter, uh, looking for peace and security around the world, and later uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and others ensured that the US expression of four freedoms was, was mapped onto the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the substantive guarantees uh, there. So the four freedoms, uh, I think all of you know this, um, they're very much part of that history, uh, belong uh, to freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. All of these are then situated as the rights guarantees of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I could bring up these guarantees, um, but does anyone want to give a, a sense of the impressions they get from these, these pictures from 1948? Any immediate impression? Are these familiar pictures to you? I want to offer a comment. Yep. Um, they're very white. They're very white. <laughs> so equally, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its efforts is a very white document. Uh, the UN at the time was made up of 58 state parties. Uh, most of Africa, most of Asia was still under empire and did not find expression in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we really have to pause when we think, well, this should be our landmark instrument for human rights. It does suffer a little bit from excluding a lot of the world. Now, I've mentioned many countries have legitimated the Universal Declaration later. They weren't involved in the drafting, but when they finally reached independence during decolonization, many countries chose to insert the language of the Universal Declaration into their human rights. These are countries in Asia and in Africa that were excluded from this process. So it's interesting to think that for, it's a very wide document. Nonetheless, in the interim, other depictions of the Universal Declaration, if we allow its meaning to evolve, have become more inclusive. Um, now, Marianne Glendon's book on Eleanor Roosevelt um, spent a lot of time documenting the participation of representatives from Lebanon, from the Philippines, from China. There was a concerted effort to bring in different philosophical and cultural traditions into the Universal Declaration. It was understood at the time as a common standard of achievement. I think this picture shows immediately the problem with that view and the need for allowing it to evolve. Very white. Any other responses to the picture? Jane? Reflecting a very traditional notion of the family. Yeah, very traditional notion mm -hmm. of the family. So this is also known as Thanksgiving dinner, a very beloved picture around Thanksgiving time. This is the uh, economic and social rights picture that I've been very intrigued about. This was known in the rest of the world as American abundance, mm -hmm. um, not a protection of rights, um, but nevertheless, it's very gendered with the, um, the, um, the breadwinner standing, perhaps the male breadwinner model of the family with the... Um, domesticated server of the food and the family sitting around. Very traditional <laughs> gendered roles here. And you can say that that applies to the text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights when, for example, economic and social rights are guaranteed for the breadwinner and his family. So the right to health, the right to education, the right to social security are funneled in to a very traditional family setting. So we're already alerted, alerted to the fact that the you know, traditional views of the family um, very much not up to speed with very non-traditional forms of the family, traditional views of whiteness and um, the absolute satisfaction of ex excluding um, other portrayals within the United States. So I think every, every criticism you have of this picture applies very much to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but also every kind of hopeful expression applies to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights if we, if we kind of 
tried to incorporate the generosity of what was going on um, in World War II, what was, what was aiming to be defeated, fascism in Europe. Um, this was what was uh, attempted. So um, let's just briefly summarize, I think, where you saw we were going with that picture mm -hmm. in what is now the substantive human rights departures that come in through human rights originalism. So um, a signature departure is the focus on religious freedom at the expense of a broader focus of many other rights. Of course, religious freedom is important, um, but it is not the uh, first and foremost, which um, uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, first wanted to say in relation to the rights guaranteed by the Commission, um, religious freedom and private property. The viewpoint of religious freedom by the Commission on Unalienable Rights went back to the Declaration of Independence and to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and emphasized uh, the traditions of uh, Protestant uh, Christianity as well as classical, uh, classical liberalism and republicanism as more secular traditions in the United States. Um, and clearly, this is not a celebration of religious diversity, um, but a majority religion, the Christian religion, um, being guaranteed. Private property is also given a lot of space in the document, perhaps not as much space as Mike Pompeo suggested it had in the Commission on Unalienable Rights report. Uh, the Commission was eager to uh, note economic and social rights, rights to healthcare, um, education, uh, social security, as I mentioned, um, also were included in the Universal Declaration. So this isn't just a freestanding commitment to private property and limited government, but a recognition that there needs to be some kind of redistributive setting in which economic and social rights can be guaranteed. Um, and two aspects are immediately diminished in the Commission on Unalienable Rights and would flow from an originalist framework, which are women's rights and LGBTQI rights, as well as a kind of accounting for racial equality in the traditions of human rights. So just very briefly, uh, the Commission on Unalienable Rights does give, does give some attention to women's rights, particularly the right to vote, uh, which was uh, obviously a major focal point for, for feminists and suffragettes at the time of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, but the whole gamut of, um, of women's rights in healthcare, obviously sexual and reproductive healthcare, in labor and work, uh, and in education are excluded in the women's rights frames that are being used in focusing on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and the fact of intersectionality is not mentioned. Um, LGBTQI rights as well are not mentioned in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Previous exclusions are continued in the Commission on Unalienable Rights reports uh, and significant progress that has made, been made in international human rights law, for example, the Joseph Carter principles are not mentioned. Uh, in terms of racial equality, the Commission was meeting during uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, the murder of George Floyd occurred during the Commission on Unalienable Rights mandate. Um, the UN Human Rights Council, we know, held an emergency urgent meeting at that time to discuss the police murder of George Floyd. His brother, uh, Phil Anise, Floyd spoke at that meeting at the UN. This isn't mentioned. Uh, there is some recognition of a need for a reckoning with America's uh, racial past in the Commission on Unalienable Rights report. But the incredible efforts by the Commission on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and the statements of the committee, the efforts of the U UN Human Rights Council at that moment, and other efforts around racial equality are addressed in this frame. Again, I, I keep thinking back to that picture. Um, so my, my kind of longer thesis is at that article, but I'm going to mention now a bit of some global trends um, because I want to locate originalism as part of a trend in human rights practice that we're seeing. Um, so uh, this is a project I'm now involved with in, with Gronje de Berker at NYU. Um, Professor Huckabee has written fantastic piece about a Trump playbook of appropriating human rights using, again, the Commission on Unalienable Rights as evidence of this. Um, there are other developments taking place in Erdogan's Turkey, in Bolsonaro's Brazil, former, the former administration in um, Modi's India, in Putin's Russia, and certain developments in Uganda, Nigeria, and Ghana, in which we're seeing human rights arguments play out in ways that respond to um, ultra-conservative religious positions, for example, 
and seem to change the methods of human rights interpretation and argument. These aren't originalist moves, but I suggest they're part of the same trend. And I give some criteria to uh, kind of assess, well, when is a human rights argument displaying some of these features of the originalist shift? Um, and so I ask whether there is an exclusionary, repressive, or anti-pluralist effect, a departure from the existing body and sources of international human rights law, um, the attempt to create a hierarchy of rights, an attempt to scapegoat, scapegoat certain groups or identify categories of persons as not entitled to claim rights, and the last for an attempt to impose restrictions on civil society, which we're increasingly seeing by those who are still maintaining human rights arguments, evidence of clear falsehood or intentional distortion, a reversal of pre previous rhetorical legal strategies by that actor, and a move to evade or reject external monitoring or independent mechanisms of accountability. I suggest when a few of those criteria are met, we might be viewing a misappropriation of human rights. So not every language of human rights um, is necessarily consistent with the way um, that language has been used before. So I'll close there with that kind of global overview. I'm happy to take questions on any of those examples. Of course, questions on, on the US in particular. But thanks already for your comments <laughs> to my questions. Okay, so we can open up the floor and um, please say your name and uh, the year that you're in here at, at Duke and um, pose any questions or reflections to Professor Young. I have many, but I'm, um, I am had the chance to often talk to Professor Young directly at these questions, and so I would be um, eager to hear from other folks in, in the room as well. So I know that the Clinton report kind of came out very soon, relatively, to when the transition between the Clinton and the Biden administration happened. So there was like some, some talk that kind of, of of how impactful the report actually was. I'm curious to hear your take on how it has affected US foreign policy, if it has at all, um, and kind of what all the broader implications of it. Yeah, that's a great question. So even before it was released, it was affecting foreign policy. Uh, that was some dispute about the process questions. Uh, as the draft report was released, uh, the US country reports that are written by the State uh, Department had already uh, expunged a reporting on reproductive freedom around the world and the protection of LGBTQI persons around the world. So already the collection of information was restricted on a justification of unalienable rights. Now, as, soon, as soon as Biden came in, the report was shelved. And so, um, Lincoln made clear that this was not going to be part of the Biden administration's approach to foreign policy. I think many groups just breathed a sigh of relief and to kind of thought, well, we don't have to talk about that. Um, I was a bit more pessimistic and thought there was a real legacy uh, to this commission and that it would be waiting in the wings for a future Republican Party administration to immediately adopt. Similar to the Mexico City policy, which is a policy which restricts funding um, for reproductive advice uh, and family planning around the world, which is a potato that changes um, with every administration. I think that unalienable rights will kind of be a potato that changes with every uh, administration, a hot potato, cold potato, <laughs> you know, it will reappear. Um, and so I, I think we need an answer. I also kind of, in, in my paper, suggest there may be even a jurisprudential legacy Given my interest in the, the interface between international human rights and domestic human rights and constitutional law in particular, I say there's a nexus between unalienable rights and US constitutional law that we ought to be worried about. Um, given that the originalist justification looks to the US constitution and prior documents, a healthy unalienable rights analysis um, is great. You know, Looking back to history, historians are doing it all the time. Historians are very skeptical of originalism, though, as a strategy that flattens history. And I think this flattening of unalienable rights in this way could find its way into constitutional doctrine. Um, and that, I think, is another um, layer of um, a very distorting effect on the rights protected in the US Constitution. Uh, and you know, given the rise of Second Amendment jurisprudence and how rapid that rise has been, Given the overturning of a 50-year precedent in the Dobbs decision on access to abortion, you know, I think this is another legacy that we should be aware of. 
to add to that, I mean, civil society, the so Duke International um, Human Rights Clinic is part of a, a civil society coalition um, sort of mobilizing against the commission and its processes and its substantive findings. And uh, that coalition has definitely been concerned about the ongoing effect um, of, of the report, um, primarily because exactly as Professor Young uh, mentioned, this was very much a transnational project, even though it was led you know, within the US State Department, you had a number of countries like sending representatives to the commission hearings. Um, the commissioners themselves have been disseminating the findings of the report globally. They've been going to numerous countries to unveil the interpretive methods and conclusions informing this approach. But also something we were really struck by is how much um, civil society in the United States were adopting the interpretations of human rights taken here. So conservative civil society, um, who were arguing that the right to religious freedom was predominant, that the right to family was predominant, um, that were really valorizing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and obscuring decades of binding treaties that were subsequent to that. And so that was, I think, a really stark moment in the US um, human rights civil society space is the ways in which this whole slew of civil society are actively in that originalist moment. Um, and so we were competing offering competing versions of human rights law and its protections um, with these groups rather than have them entirely absent themselves from a human rights analysis. So that that's not going anywhere, right? That, that sort of huge contingent um, of civil society in the United States who very much draw upon this uh, rationale is very much uh, influential. On the one, I have a couple of thoughts and I sort of think your, your reaction to them. So on the one hand, I think autocrats or pressured regimes of all stripes have become much better in utilizing human rights language and discourse to validate um, their particular laws and policies. So it used to be that you would have governments that would simply deny nor, um, but never really engaged. Uh, and that was also true for civil society that was at odds with the kind of evolutionary progressive kind of civil society. That's been gone for a while, and these misappropriations, that broader framework, definitely is there. And it's, in, you know, the, the, the um, debates and contestations have really been joined over what the appropriate methodology is. So, I'm trying to square how to fit the unalienable rights commission's choices within that broader set of um, developments. So there were so many ways that they could have decided to really ground originalism and uh, fundamental rights. They could have um, really root and branch kind of gone back to the original US documents and said so that's really the, the main core. And then you get a lot of the same originalist emphases that you see in the Bill of Rights itself. So you, you see textual references to religion, of course, and to the right to bear arms, and freedom of, um, freedom of speech, property protections, etc. But if you include in your originalist frame the UDHR, bring with, and we've talked about this, you bring with you so much of textual commitment to rights that seem antithetical to the broader political project. And so I have, I suppose, two reactions to that. One is to think that this isn't an originalist move at all. It's, it's really just a, another kind of misappropriation. And uh, that we really shouldn't think about it as originalist because it doesn't even pass the last test for originalism, because you have all these other tests, because, as you point out, it's an incomplete project where it's understood that there would be further development, because the U.S. itself has accepted binding commitments that go beyond the UDHR and accept, continue to accept those. So there's so many problems with an originalist frame that I, I wonder whether, I, I just am trying to understand if this is just window dressing originalism or another kind of misappropriation, or if, in your understanding, the commission um, 
thought that it was somehow legitimating its process and its outcome by claiming the UDHR, <coughs> even though you could come up with 20 reasons why their originalism to the UDHR is completely specious. So, any thoughts? That yeah, it's, it's a great question. The originalism that I'm identifying could be seen as window dressing, as just putting a veneer to further galvanize uh, a constituency that loves originalism and loves the heroism, heroism of a moment in which the United States was great and a restoration of that moment. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a signature effort of the United States. It was a prominent drafter and, and involver. Declaration of Independence, of course, uh, was of an incredible influence around the world. Um, so those features make um, these moves extraordinarily palatable to a constituency that wants to restore to that heroic moment of the US past. Um, there, one way to answer this would be the speciousness of it applies to constitutional originalism as well and that originalism is always window dressing for uh, conservative political values and preferences that need to find some kind of legitimating uh, package being constraints of judges. Um, and so there are people who write about originalism in that way as bunk in the constitutional space. And it would be, I think, an easier effort to write about this as bunk, you know, as a legitimating package for um, conservative political values and a restoration project of America's past. Um, so I'm actually very open to all of those uh, uh, assessments of what's going on here. And uh, interestingly, Marianne Glendon, the chairperson, was never a big proponent of originalism conservative. She was also never um, a card-carrying um, uh, kind of Bigger, hostile to, um, well, she's never card carrying property rights um, celebrator without a recognition that uh, society needed social support. So, very much engaged in Catholic social thought, in the importance of economic and social rights as a human rights project. Um, interestingly, I think what we're seeing is a new configuration of conservative politics that um, moves beyond neoliberal market approach uh, of property rights protection, bringing um, other guarantees slowly with it. I think we're seeing a, a, a new settlement occurring now in conservative politics. And this is an interesting uh, feature of that consolidation effort, being funneled through a document that promises a lot more. You could call the Universal Declaration of Human Rights an economic populist document. Um, it appeals to a marginalized um, poor or working class group, which obviously makes up um, a big space in Republican Party politics at the moment. So there's some interesting reconfigurations going on that this project is a part of, and I think as it's being knit together, it's hard to just put a stamp and say, oh, originalism at work. Certainly originalism is playing a role it hasn't played before uh, in human rights politics, but I, 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 I like your point about its broader compatibility with other uh, authoritarian trends or autocrats now purporting to celebrate human rights when they have in the past openly diminished or dismissed them. Uh, you can imagine Trump's Secretary of State going in all sorts of directions here. The America First policy was one that was very adaptable to accommodating autocrats. It was not a, a policy in the beginning. Rex Tillerson was not interested in human rights. Um, and so uh, this move was suddenly, we're interested in human rights, but Trump still is very generous towards dictators around the world. Um, you know, the, the rhetoric of Trump is still with us at the same time as, as this commission is meeting. But very interesting politics going on. Um, and those trends, uh, those trends of combining a very populist move of celebrating human rights, but a very conservative interpretation of human rights, ultra-conservative, religiously informed 
um, are continuing. Originalism is not the package that's being presented in other countries yet. But that's a great, a very challenging question to kind of absolutely, it, nothing is co coherent here or new here. I would just add in, in practice what was very interesting is that you know, the UDHR was part of the mandate of the commission, one of the two sources, um, but in practice there was a, a, a discussion around well, how much could the subsequent set of binding human rights treaties inform like, the commission, commission's work. Um, and there's an effort to really you know, explain why those can be taken into account, but ultimately prioritized in the final work of the commission. And so I think it's an interesting moment of like this political mandate to focus, you know, to lock in these originalist um, sources and then the commission that then grappled with that, but ultimately ended up really centering it. So it's something, um, it can feel disingenuous, but in many ways it was really the project they're undertaking in a very full um, approach um, in, in sort of conformity with the mandate given like, to the to the commission, and there's some very interesting behind the scenes writings that have been as they released around the effort to kind of how to package this binding sort of treaty post UDHR, um, and to think about that in a coherent way as well. Question. Yeah, that's a really great question, and one aspect of the Commission's follow-up work I haven't mentioned is something that could be characterized as another deep effort of coming up with a set of principles that could be a declaration but wouldn't be a, a treaty as a source of binding obligation and multilateralism in that way, and that's the Geneva Consensus Declaration. Um, and so this is a, a declaration that uh, announces very importantly that women's that women's health is very important, and that women have a right to health, uh, uh, and that right never extends to access to abortion. So and it's an explicitly anti-abortion um, uh, document that um, here is here. Uh, I have a few other slides here if it came up in question. So um, the Geneva Consensus Declaration signposts sovereignty, national sovereignty, as extraordinarily important for all states. So like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a lot of states want to sign up to something like that because they want their sovereignty to be respected. Obviously, the, the mere recognition of human rights does undercut national sovereignty. Um, at, at the same time, there's a concern for women's health, the protection of human life, meaning, meaning the life of the fetus, uh, the strengthening of the family, the basic unit of society, and the defense of sovereignty. So these are the four pillars of this Geneva Consensus that was um, uh, initiated actually in a lot of uh, NGOs in about 2010. Um, but by the time um, Pompeo became Secretary of State, there was a, a concerted effort by the United States, as well as Brazil uh, under Bolsonaro, uh, Egypt, and a few other countries to really give force to this declaration it wasn't actually signed in Geneva. Uh, COVID was going on. It was signed in Washington, D.C., probably over a Zoom call. But, um, but it was called the Geneva Consensus, I think, to harken back to the great multilateral instruments that come out of Geneva and obviously the Geneva um, uh, protections. I mean, that signals, one would think, the United Nations and human rights law, and this is a side project, which tries to get into kind of soft law principles that are enduring and small c constitutional. The whole theory of what makes something small c constitutional and worth protecting as a kind of uh, original document, a source of meaning. Um, I think the attempt is to make the Geneva Consensus look something like that. Um, so people like Adrian Vermeule who talked about Jules Gentium today talk about the Geneva Consensus Declaration mm -hmm. as that aspect. So it's a really fascinating question. We think of treaties as how to amend earlier documents, what does CEDAW look to us today like? You know, we have all these ways of, of providing an um, evolving interpretation or evolutive uh, interpretation to treaties to allow for changes over time. 
course, the US Constitution is almost impossible to amend, as we know. Um, and so that is kind of a neat argument for originalism when, when you require such an incredible buy-in from a very polarized um, constituency that it's nigh on impossible to amend the US Constitution mm -hmm. under current arrangements. Um, and so uh, you couldn't amend the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You would follow up with further constitutive documents um, they might say the Geneva Consensus Declaration heads in that territory. We might say you know, there were special events, the Beijing Conference for Women, the Stockholm Declaration, the Rio Declaration. There are these constitutive moments in international human rights law and international environmental law when something landmark was passed in a declaratory spirit uh, without setting up a treaty. These might be worth looking to. Um, and many people do, this commission did not. Um, but the treaties themselves are constitutional documents um, and they have a procedure for ratifying, um, which obviously is constrained here in the United States for a variety of reasons. So, great question. Yes. Just for a little bit more time, in the end, the draft plan is sort of like the original. Do you think this effort and intended end to this? Does it it does seem like there's a recognition by the school of thought that human rights are not things out there to throw, but they have to come home. And so if they're going to come home, you might as well have a, you know, make them palatable to our constituents. It seems to be like a possibility. Yeah, well, I think it's great to think of silver linings. <laughs> I also think that we should never reject the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as not belonging with our, within our contemporary human rights thinking. Now, that, that isn't a moment we should ignore, but neither should we valorize and freeze to that time. But attention on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with a kind of understanding that it suffers from major flaws, it needs updating. And there is incredible human rights politics occurring within the United States. That if you draw out your lens, you get to see you know, action around the right to housing, around, around the right to health care. Um, around the right to education at the state level, even at the federal level, you know, there have been attempts. Uh, these promises of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which aren't found in the ICCPR, uh, somewhat less in, this, in, in the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, in some ways, interestingly, there are aspects of the Convention Against Torture that become interesting. Um, but, but the fact that the Universal Declaration has it all set out, I think, is, is something that we should be conscious of and then look to current instantiations of that practice. Um, and, that, and that's, I think, great um, pity about that process. There's a lot of national human rights institutions that are set up. There's a lot of national human rights consultation processes that are set up. And oftentimes, it's a, a taking stock activity of where, where do we see political action around human rights at home? What does it look like in this country that we're part of, whether it, in whatever country it is around the world? There are those efforts which made me in initially really curious as to where would they look? Where, where, where are they going to go to see instantiations of human rights practice that are bringing it home? Um, but unfortunately, in cutting it off at that time, I think we, we miss that. Nevertheless, a conversation about the UDHR. Why did Norman Rockwell draw the way he did? The Saturday Evening Post, which was the mag magazine that commissioned his art, gave him a ban. He could only, he could only paint white people for that magazine. Which is extraordinary. He, he has a mosaic in, in the UN headquarters in New York. You can go and see that. He was constrained by that. Um, but think of the ways in which he was, you know, that the message was distorted at that moment uh, that we need to be aware of today between text and picture. But yes. Um, thank you so much for um, coming to speak to us. Can I talk a little bit about the time of the Oh, great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's a concern that um, there is a right to everything, a proliferation of human rights. I think we kind of 
need to have a sense of what's going on um, with, with the rights discourse, with rights talk, with what's, what's being included in the label. Um, Philip Alston even wrote about this in 1984 and said we need quality control on these new rights. I think he was writing about a right to tourism or a, a right to disarmament. And he said it's not cause for, for cutting off these new rights. It's just cause for thinking about evaluating these, these claims um, and setting up a process to evaluate. So he would be in that moment very much in, um, if I can go back to that space. In international human rights law gives you a process to evaluate new claims. And Philip Alston in 1984 would have said, let's strengthen international human rights law or multilateral effort to evaluate these newer claims and bring in a, a public process listen to the claimants, listen to their articulation. Um, and it's interesting in this human rights vernacularization frame, you hear even more when you're not constrained by UN process. Um, Sally Engel Murray's work was very, very influential in anthropologist, suggesting you could hear claims to women's protection from violence in a very different language. But if you listen and if you interview them, it was international human rights work at work mm -hmm vernacularized in lots of different local contexts, translated in, in different languages. Um, so I think unlike Philip Olsen in 1984, Sally Engel Mary would have said, be very careful with that evaluative process. Be careful that you're not blinkered in your own Western frame um, so you're not hearing these new claims. And I think she laid out a really sensitive approach to listening from below, listening to new claims of human rights. It's a great question. I think um, that in constitutional law, on the other hand, there's a whole doctrine in other countries of proportionality. Um, proportionality allows a kind of balancing of different rights claims, often rights of intention, the right to private property, the right to health care, who's paying you. These are tensions that need to be evaluated and assessed. Um, in a lot of different countries, we see proportionality doctrine playing that role. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of civil law countries have this doctrine. You see a greater inclusion of, of newer rights um, because there's always a, a way of balancing them and bringing them back to original principles of freedom and dignity and equality. Then they can, you know, yes, you can have, uh, there's a famous German case, a right to shoot pigeons in a park. <laughs> you know, this is seen as kind of a, a, a massive right. But we're going to limit it in all sorts of ways. Um, we just recognize this is a claim you're making. Um, it's not, you know, we're not going to saddle the state with an obligation to fulfill that um, because of our doctrine of proportionality. So it's a great question that lawyers have solved in all, all these ways. So, Sat Valley and Murray have solved in a few ways. Well, on, on that note, um, that great question, um, thank you again, Professor Young, uh, yeah. for presenting your work and for engaging with our questions and reflections on that. Yeah, well, thank you all for your mm -hmm. questions. I really enjoyed it.